Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Today, a little lunacy on the show as we've rolled around to another full moon, and everybody knows I love the opportunity to talk about my favorite moonshines when we have the full moon up in the sky and making us all look up. I know you will, and I know you do. Hope you have clear weather. Full moon is technically... Uh, sometime in the middle of the morning tomorrow and uh that is of course august 1st july 31st august 1st is this the full moon of july or the full moon of august that native americans celebrated well it rolls around and we'll uh every 28 days so we'll explain all that to you as we look at this beautiful green screen that a photographer took uh, with a telephoto lens over a a spot that he had to plan this in advance to get those people there rising. I've actually seen a video of things like that. And that allows me to say hello to Marty Winkle, my co-producer. Uh, how you doing, Marty? We had a little audio problem to solve. We went a few minutes late, but thank you for calling Jessica, our Trekkie Techie, and taking care of that. You said you went and saw Oppenheimer in the, this weekend, and it was rather long, huh? Three hours long. <laughs> It was a decent movie, but uh, it was just too long. Did they have an intermission like the longest day back in the 60s? No. No? <laughs> no. No. Oh, you got a strong bladder then, Marty. <laughs> they have stadium seats at the theater, but still, three hours is a long time. Huh. But a good movie, Oppenheimer? It was good. Um, it helped if you had a little bit of background about him. But uh, I took my, my grandson. He's 24. He knew nothing about Oppen Oppen Oppenheimer. Yeah. And he was bored. Uh huh. So. Yeah, well, a great uh, movie, I'm sure, about the, one of the men behind the atomic bomb and his uh, 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 conflicts with doing it, right, Marty? Uh, well, no one. Yeah, political. Um, well, it's hard to explain. It was a lot of accusations, a lot of un mistrust of, of Oppenheimer. They thought he was a communist. So oh. a lot of problems. Right. Well, quite a story of history, uh, of, of world history, just not American history there. So uh, thank you, Marty, for chiming in on that. Uh, like I said, a full moon weekend reminds me of my favorite moonshines. I've done many programs on the moon, and sometimes I repeat things, some I don't. So don't turn me off yet until you just find out how loony I'm going to get today, all right? But uh, we love talking about astronomy very frequently, try to once a, a month or once a week, actually, as there's always something in the sky to make you look up. Nothing is more close to everybody's heart and mind than the nearest celestial neighbor, 250,000 miles away, our moon. Still takes us three days to get there, going uh, averaging 30,000 miles an hour, basically. Uh, and I probably got my first uh bite into the moon craziness and wanting to know about the moon watching this man walter cronkite i think many of us baby boomers owe a lot of our science um uh, stimulation if you will and, and natural science stimulation with the programs that were on every sunday night right after ed sullivan or he was before ed sullivan i think marty and then ed sullivan came on and seemed like the whole country was watching and there'd be great documentaries of of safaris and and then he and Warner von Braun had these classic shows to talk about going to the moon and beyond and uh, some of the most watched television of its time. So Walter Cronk, uh, Walter Cronk, Walt Disney, Walt Disney there slapped me around. Of course, we're just 50 miles away from the the Disney World over there that uh, he created. Uh, well, he didn't create it here. It was created first in California and then brought here. And so we're one of the the offshoot attractions over here in Titusville, where our humble American Space Museum uh, love having you in here to share our amazing artifacts that are truly one of a kind and celebrate the birth of America's space age in its delivery room, Brevard County. Well, I'm going to tell you some of my favorite things about the moon. Like I said, one, the moon is never the same. The shadows along the Terminator. That's that dark line between night and day. Nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? The Terminator is our line between night and day on Earth. That's twilight. 
all right, whether it's morning twilight or evening twilight. Well, the Terminator moves across the surface of the moon in a slower fashion than it does here on Earth, of course, uh, as we can watch the shadows move by the hour. But the 28-day cycle, uh, you can see them change literally. Uh, uh, through a telescope, you can see features of the moon change. The shadows of mountains get uh, that were once long get shorter as the sun rises over them. So uh, it's something that is always enjoy enjoyed looking through a telescope at. It is never the same. In fact, I think it takes 18 years for, if I'm looking July 31st at the moon tonight, 18 years it'll take for it to be the exact same look uh, 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 that, that I would see uh, again tonight. So I do a lot of drawing and sketching, photography of the moon. Everyone wants to photograph the moon, even with their smartphones when we ha do outreach programs. So, um, but it is never, ever the same. And that's why I like looking at it. And we've not been able to see it for a few days because there, we've had some cloudy, stormy weather at night, which is unusual around here. Well, the moon is also not a four-letter word and uh, a four-letter cuss word, I mean. And some of my stargazing buddies would disagree with me because the as the moon gets brighter, that moonshine wipes out all but the brightest stars. And therefore, the faint fuzzies, those Messier objects I've talked about, like uh, the Great Nebula of Orion, which is already set, but we're looking at all kinds of things in the Milky Way right now that are washed away. Even the Milky Way itself is hard to see because the moonlight washes it away. However, I spend my time looking at the moon instead of uh, putting my telescope away until it rises after uh, midnight so I can you see those faint fuzzies. But... Um, and by looking at the moon over and over, you learn that it is a real place, okay? And it has real features with real names, mostly of historical men and some women, but all the history people from uh, Tycho Brahe, a great observer. You've got the philosophers of Plato and Archimedes and, and the scientist Copernicus. And Galileo, you would think, would have a big crater, but he is kind of an indistinct crater. Uh, for Galileo, uh, Longamontus and, and Clavius, uh, Aristarchus, all, all kinds of names come off the top of my head that I've looked at these features. And you get a moon chart and you start appreciation that everything has a name, just like geological features on the uh, earth. So this is sel selenography uh, and uh, Selene is uh, one of the Roman names for the moon and Artemis is the other one, the sister of Apollo. Of course, we'll talk about the Artemis program here in a few minutes. Uh, but one thing that always bugs me, folks, is uh, there are over 640 satellites orbiting other planets called moons, and they all have proper names. Phobos and Deimos of Mars, Tri Titan and Triton. Titan is Sa um, Saturn. Triton is uh, Neptune. And then Io, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, the four famous moons that Galileo saw, Jupiter. But our moon is just called moon. And half the time it's not even capitalized, like all personal pronouns should be. That's just another pet peeve is that moon and sun and solar system are uh, capitalized uh, regularly like I think they should. That is the name of our satellite that's orbiting us, is moon. Okay, we could have called it... Uh, uh, Gary, all right, we, we, we could have called it Marty, all right, but no, we just call it Moon, uh, but uh, the Greeks had the name Selene and Artemis, Egyptians called it Isis, okay, uh, and that was played very big into their mythology, um, so, you know, even the names of Uranus, if you didn't know, are all named after Shakespeare characters like Puck and Miranda, but no, nope, ours is just called Moon. All right, so um, I don't know if we'll ever change that. Maybe calling it La Luna, like the French do, would, would uh, take some of the bitterness out of my mouth. I don't know. But I'm not going to get any more worked up over that because uh, we do have these 12 men that we love that walked on the moon, four of them alive right now, okay? And that, of course, would be Buzz Aldrin, the second one there on the left, on the top. And in the middle, you've got... 
the uh, well, you got Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin's alive. Then you got Al Bean, and uh, I mean Pete Conrad first, and then Al Bean on the right. Then Apollo 14 was, of course, Al Shepard and Edgar Mitchell, both passed away. 15 that we're celebrating right now, David Scott is 91 years old, and Jim Irwin passed away. He's the first of the 12 to die of a heart attack at age 69 some 20 years ago. We lost John Young uh, on the bottom left, but uh, there's Charlie Duke is still around, 87 years old. Gene Cernan, uh, and then the last one to set foot on the moon, of course, Gene Cernan was the last one to have a human foot on it, but the 12th of the 12th is, of course, um, Jack um, Schmidt. And, uh, yeah, Jack Schmidt is uh, also 87. So the youngest is 87 years old, the two of them there. And uh, they'll all soon be gone, my heroes of our childhood, us baby boomers. Um I met a couple of them. I met Charlie. Char you know, Charlie Duke is just awesome. Marty's had uh, Duke and uh, several of these others at uh, some of your Grumman gatherings that will be no more. Uh, Marty, what would you say about some of the moonwalkers that you've met? Put you on the spot there. I know they're all fine fellas. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? They, you know, they're, they're heroes. You know, they've done things that, you know, only 12 people have done before. Yeah. I'm so excited to see your heroes. I'm at the University of Tennessee to see uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt talk for the first time. And uh, to drive down from uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, where I lived, about an a hour drive. And I ran in the men's room right away. And lo and behold, Jack Schmidt appeared right at the urinal beside me. <laughs> Not the place to chit-chat about moon rocks, Marty. All right. So uh, I met him and... and uh, that was very interesting. I told him I'd wash my hands twice before I shook his hand out in the, in the lobby. Uh, Marty, this is very interesting that uh, as we look at our moonwalkers there, that some of the greatest astronomers of the 1700s and 1800s, they not only thought that the moon was inhabited, they were convinced that it was, all right? Maybe not by these selenite workers of the first men on the moon, the H.G. Wells, wonderful movie of 1964. But um, uh, many scientists, uh, one of the greatest astronomers of all time, Sir William Herschel, who discovered Uranus in 1781, in the categorizer of thousands of objects in a telescope, he was convinced the moon was inhabited by intelligent beings, and he said so in the front pages of the London Times. He was frustrated his telescopes couldn't find lunar cities. Now, he didn't understand it didn't have an atmosphere on the moon. That would have changed his mind. But, uh, yes, you'd be kind of shocked uh, at some of the scientists uh, of the, like, 1600s, the colonial days of, of America, and then the 1700s and 1800s. They just thought for granted that every planet was, was filled with life and vegetation. Venus, they thought, because it was covered in clouds, we'd find a lush jungle and maybe dinosaurs on it. Mars, they just had to be inhabited. Uh, but uh, now we find just the other side. Everybody is skeptical that there's life anywhere, except people in Congress, Marty. I did watch some of those congressional UFO hearings there, and... Uh, uh, you know, I kind of miss newspapers. If that congressional hearing last week where they had some some um, people talking, whistleblowers they call them, that said there's, there's biologics in some captured alien vehicles. Well, that'd be roaring on headlines if we had newspapers today. Uh, today, if you happen to see it on your news that you're holding in your hand or on TV, I guess you might know about it. But I think a lot of news passes people by. But selenites on the moon living underground like in this movie by first men on the moon in 1964 uh, uh, a lot of astronomers thought that would just be normal well something that is also normal is the small size of the moon i've said many times take your fingers take your hand and hold it out at arm's length okay and your little pinky finger because this is a ratio, humans are in a ratio, no matter what size you are, six foot five, five foot ten like me, your arm ratio is usually about the same. And my little finger can cover up that full moon right there. All right, right there, can full, that's, that's my little finger, folks, not my middle one. And uh, that's a half a degree, folks. So 
half a degree well it's 180 degrees from horizon to horizon yeah so a uh, 360 moons stacked end to end to end overhead and then coming down could yeah that is how tiny the moon really is but it's big in our mind's eye uh, of course the moon illusion we've talked about how things look big when juxtaposed against the uh, mountains buildings this uh this high power line uh, framework there well also in the, the days of old before electricity particularly native americans would hold secret councils under moonlight okay there they see the bison in the moon in this one have anyone had a secret meeting under moonlight you know how about those film noirs that i love so much uh love the moonlight scenes outside it always adds something surreal the moonlight in our minds and eyes and uh, henry wadsworth longfellow thought, thought the same thing uh years ago uh, in a poem that he wrote about that so but the moon uh is not though it seems bright and looks bright in our sky all right it really isn't okay the moon is um a poor reflector of light as you see crystals make a halo around the moon occasionally a sign of weather native americans would count the number of stars other cultures that would indicate how many days until it rains the number of stars you can see inside this circle around the moon or maybe some catastrophic event or good events going to happen in three or four days i see a star on the outside of the, this moon ring here that i took not too long ago but the moon uh the, we call in astronomy reflective is called albedo and the albedo of the earth is like eight seventy percent because of our oceans venus because it's covered completely in clouds is like a mirror over 90 percent light does it reflect back but the moon's albedo is about the same as a lump of coal or or 17 percent or well how about we've all seen a well-worn asphalt highway all right whatever cities you're in interstate highway or, or whatever that gray color is about the same color on the moon a well-worn highway that kind of grayish that the black bowl uh goes into uh is what we're looking at so it's a very poor reflector and you think back if it was if it was uh made of like a formica or other more reflective type materials Oh my gosh, uh, you know, literally read, it would change the night culture of human beings to where we would probably be more nocturnal with the availability of the moonlight uh, uh, at least one uh, uh, once a month is basically when we get most of the moonlight. Well, there is no such thing as the dark side of the moon, folks. Hate to uh, break it to all those Pink Floyd lovers out there. But uh, there's always half of the moon is illuminated. And here we see the, the half that we see and the other half we don't see, the back side of the moon in these satellite photographs. Look at the difference, folks. Now, when the Earth and moon were formed, and we think the moon was uh, formed by a Mars-sized object that hit the Earth four billion years ago and ripped out part of the, of the Earth. And then, because it's lighter materials, like the... Like the, the uh, the, the first layers of the Earth's mantle is what the moon's made of. Not much heavy or iron in heavier elements. But it looks like when it kind of froze and its face was stuck towards the Earth, which is common for a lot of moons, they're stuck in this uh, rotational fr uh, freeze. It looks like the magma in the center was pulled towards the Earth's gravity because it wasn't, there's not many places in the back. But look at all those craters, all right? And we're going to land down at the bottom here in a crater called Shackleford. Well, uh, the backside's covered with thousands more craters, only a small dark maria or ancient seas, lava seas, no mountain ranges, um, which the mountain ranges on the moon anyway aren't tectonic mountain ranges. They're, they're impacts from, as you see, the other side, our side of the moon. You can see gigantic ovals caused by asteroids that hit the moon and then the they were filled in by lava. Due to the slight wobble of the moon, called liberation, we see some of the backside in the limbs, accounting for 59%. Now, here's my moon map here. I meant to show you there, because I did have Charlie Walker autograph it 
back in the day. Charlie Duke. I mean, Charlie Duke. Yeah, Charlie Walker on my mind. Uh, he's coming to town. Charlie Duke. Thanks, Marty. Um, and uh, so, but the moon wobbles a little bit like this back and forth because of the earth pulling on it. So we see almost 60% of it. And that's fun to look at the edges. And sometimes you can see this this uh, one, uh, the, they call it the uh, unknown sea uh, that uh, can be visible at times or not. Well, enough about the front and back side of the moon. How about the music of the moon? Marty, I have over listed over 100 songs that have the word moon in their title. From David Bowie's Moon Age Daydream to Van Morrison's Moon Dance to Yellow Moon by the Neville Brothers. Uh, uh, just just on and on. Uh, moon River, okay, and my favorite, Moon Shadow by Cat Stevens there. So how many moon songs can you recall? How about Picasso Moon by the Grateful Dead? Uh, uh, Moonlight Drive by The Doors, okay. Uh, all kinds of uh, moon songs out there ad infinitum just so to show you how people have been influenced by the moon whether they have a telescope look up understand it or not and of course pop culture has some tasty offerings to celebrate the moon like moon pie and now they have them in different flavors of course uh and moonshine but i stay away from that kind of moonshine all right uh, I like the kind that I can get in my telescope. That's the kind you can't get too much of. But uh, growing, not growing up, but living over 35 years in Appalachia between the Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains, certainly saw my share of moonshine around there, and it's amazing how that's taken off. And you always got to have a picture of the moon on it there. Well, wherever you are, when the moon is out, you look up. You, you, you see, even if it's a sliver of a moon, uh like this is like we call the two day old moon all right you can see the outline of the moon that we can't see that's the uh young moon and the old moon's arms is another way they put that but you're always going to look up and see things uh and it's always fascinating to try to understand how old the moon is in days Amateur astronomers talk like that, like the moon is 14 days old, Marty, and if everybody knows it, that's full moon, all right? A little bit after full moon would be 19 days old, and that would rise uh, probably 11, 12 o'clock at night. The first quarter moon, if you have a 28-day cycle of the moon, one quarter of it's seven days. So the first quarter moon uh, is there to the right, the last quarter moon or is 21 days old. So that's how we talk in astronomy. And I may say to one of my buddies, hey, the moon's uh, uh, 20 days old, so you wanna do some stargazing tonight because that 20 day old moon's not gonna rise till after midnight, probably after we get done stargazing and go to bed. And again, when the moon shine is in the sky, you can't see some of the galaxies and nebulas and star clusters and uh, glob globular clusters that are up there by the thousands. Well, this being August 31st, August for, uh, uh, July 31st, August 1st, uh, full moon, here are the moons from January, February, March. They kind of make sense. The full moon of January was called the wolf moon, not because uh, they saw that they could hear the wolf's baying because they were hungry, all right? So we've got here either the buck moon, the full buck moon or the full sturgeon moon. Both are outdoor activities. Of course, hunting and fishing. So you could call it either one. Bucks are mating and very active right now. Full sturgeon is at its peak being caught right now in, in areas of the Midwest and I think uh, Lake Michigan and some of the lakes up there. Uh, but then uh, we'll get to the, also this uh, August can be called the green corn moon as where in uh, September, when the real harvest starts taking place, you could have the full corn moon. Uh, and then, of course, you got the hunter moon and the uh, uh, harvest moon. They don't list the harvest moon there. Uh, and the beaver moon is usually November when beavers are damming up things and, and getting ready to go in. And a cold winter moon, of course. So you can name it any moon you want. Make your own moon uh, uh, names up there. Make your own moon map, make your own moon charts, whatever you want to do, it's up there for you to enjoy. 
Well, one thing we do enjoy is making uh, faces out of the moon, the man in the moon that I have always had a hard time seeing. I see the rabbit in the moon, bison up there in the upper right-hand corner, uh, a lot of furry creatures, squirrels, um, an antelope is lower left. Was that what that's supposed to be? But uh, time and time again, I've told you that I always see the profile of a woman in the moon, on the full moon. With that, her pendant is the bright star, bright crater Tycho. It's a fresh crater, maybe only 50 million years old, that uh, its rays are spread across down there. So, see her there and there. And I'm not going to ask Marty if you see it because you have a hard time seeing things like that. But you, again, make up some features on the moon. All right, get the kids out there. Look through binoculars. Binoculars are so underrated when looking at the moon. But here's something you don't bet you didn't know about the moon. Is the moon and the Earth are a binary planetary system. Okay, that's right. We're by bi, binary planet. All right, because the moon is about one quarter the size of the Earth. They actually rotate around each other. All right, with the the epicenter of the rotation is inside the Earth's crust. This is the same binary planet situation with this is Pluto and its large planet, Charon. This one for C-H-A-R-O-N. All right, this is to scale. The uh, Pluto is smaller than the moon, our Earth's moon, and but its planet, the planet Pluto and its moon Charon are a one to four ratio, just like the Earth and the moon there. So they affect each other uh, a lot. This is where we get tides on the Earth, uh, very much influence. So it's a very dynamic biplanetary system. And our Earthlings have left hundreds of tons of debris on the moon. Every one of these places marked there is an impact or a landing place. The green are the Russians, all right? Uh, tons and tons and tons, and this doesn't even have this, the Saturn S-1B rockets that were aimed at the moon after they launched the, uh, uh, the, the Apollo astronauts to the moon. Uh, then they crashed them to get them out of the way. You've also got several uh, lunar... Uh, uh, modules up there that when they were done they uh, crashed them so they wouldn't be in the way and accidentally get hit and of course artemis we're excited to a year from november to send four astronauts flying by the moon this is an actual photograph taken by a gopro camera on the the uh solar panels of the orion spacecraft you can see that lit up inside there they had the mannequins inside there getting data as it drifted by about 6,000 miles, and Artemis II is going to do the same trajectory. It's not going to orbit the moon unless they change their mind on that. It's going to do a nice pa pass by to prove uh, all of the technology. Well, that technology has got to keep up with the 50-year-old technology of the Apollo lunar modules. Of course, we've talked a lot about Marty working on that as an electrical engineer. This is your hair-raising moment, Marty, is whether that guillotine is going to uh, separate all those wires and pipes and all the pyrotechnics over 20 different locations go off at the same time uh, as they did for all the wonderful landings of the moon, uh, all six of them. And Apollo 15 uh, lifted off the moon August 2nd, 1971. We're going to have Hazel Banks here tomorrow. We talk a lot about Hazel and Apollo era secretary. Gemini and Apollo era. We're going to have her talk about some of the astronauts and working in the secretarial pool at Kennedy Space Center for our nation's heroes there. Well, Neil and Buzz brought back about 57 pounds of rock. All right. And, um, uh, and, and some dirt. Uh, very, very little. Uh, the, the other five landers brought back... Uh, almost 900 more pounds of rock, a little over, under 1,000 pounds of, of rock. And, of course, they pounded a few deep uh, uh, core samples to get any striated layers. Here's always what, uh, and here's we look at this fun picture of Apollo, of Dave and Scott on Apollo um, 15 and seated in the uh, uh, rover. You can see Jim Irwin. 
compared Hadley Rill in the mountains. As I talk up, we look at this cool picture. The Apollo 11 astronauts took 97 photos on the moon, on the surface of the moon, with their Hasselblad 70 millimeter uh, cameras. All right, 97 photos. That's like less than four 24 exposure rolls. All right. Folks, I've seen more pictures of your food on Facebook than I've seen pictures that the Apollo astronauts took of themselves on the moon. In fact, because uh, Neil carried the camera around most of the time and handed it off to Buzz, uh, Buzz only took two pictures of, of Armstrong uh, on the moon. Uh, so uh, all the photos on the moon missions are available on Flickr.com. Frame by frame, just as they shot them, you're going to see all the bad ones, overexposed ones. Uh, they're they're going to wish they'd trained them a little more to take, because uh, a lot of the pictures are overexposed. The f-stop need to be shut down to like 22 instead of 11. Uh, but they're there for you to see. In fact, they're copyright free, paid for by the American taxpayer. All right. So there's a moon rock that I photographed that brought back by Apollo 12. That's the Johnson Space Center, just at the end of their Saturn V rocket. What does the moon smell like, folks? All right. What kind of cheese does the moon smell like? Limburger cheese, Swiss cheese. That was always the fun joke that the moon was smelled like green cheese. Well, astronauts uniformly say that it smelled like gunpowder or uh, fireplace ashes, particularly moist fireplace ashes. That makes sense given the violent impacts of all of the uh, uh, meteors of all sizes on the moon over the billions and billions of years. Okay, and um, there's also many strange properties of the moon. Uh, there it is it is uh, the particles can wreak havoc on spacesuits because it is very abrasive and it's like. Uh, it's finer than talcum powder, folks. Very finer than talcum powders. Some gloves and boots uh, will have to be were uh, from the moonwalkers had some of their elements stripped away by the abrasiveness, uh, like they were worn. Uh, moon soil called regolith also has iron in it, so magnetic power can be maybe used to eliminate some of the contamination. So, uh, and if you have your chance to get your hands on a moon rock. Uh, like I did, uh, you better give it back because <laughs> it's a it's a uh, federal offense to own any moon rocks in private private uh, collections or anything like that. That's a friend of mine, Paul Lewis from the University of Tennessee, that always had this moon rock in his pocket for outreach education. That is a rare white moon rock from Apollo 16 in a piece of acrylic glass that uh, I always love showing. And uh, why do we go out and see the moon rises? Because everyone is so different. If you see the moon last night, it's going to be different tonight, no matter what your backdrop. I lucked out on December 2020, uh, right before the COVID days there, of getting a moon rise over the Atlantic Ocean in what we call a mirage. This was through a small telescope. Uh, never have seen this since uh, in three years trying to capture it since then. Uh, so, uh, but once in a while, uh, you get lucky and once in a blue moon, you get lucky. What does once in a blue moon mean? It really means two full moons in the same month. Yes. Some, some uh, years we have 13 full moons. Most, most of the months we have 13 full moons because of that 28 day cycle in a 365 day year. Uh, so, uh, uh, Still very influenced on mind and man all of our lives, okay? Uh, I know uh, Chala Zan, thank you for watching today. In fact, Marty, I was looking up some old uh, Stay Curious from 2020, and Chala Zan, you've been with us uh, all that time. Doug Forrest, good to see you, my friend. Tom Usiak, probably give Tommy a call tonight. Uh, Robert Law is up in Dundee, Scotland. Carrie Fink is watching. Thank you, Carrie. Space Monkey, we appreciate your support. Gary Gerald, I got your message, and I'll call you uh, later. Gary up there in Collins, Georgia. Uh, Gary Folsom's watching. Appreciate you. Carlton Bailey, CB's out there. I'm going to be calling everybody tonight. I haven't talked to you in a while either. Tom Celentano's watching us, and Bill Whiting, Dave Stangy, and Hazel Banks. And I already talked about Hayes coming on tomorrow. You're going to enjoy that lady 
uh, uh, just uh, she's been on many times, but we can't get enough of her inspiring you younger generation to uh, just do it. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what it takes. That is um, what Hazel talks a lot about. But uh, we're going to have some fun with her talking about some stories she hasn't shared before. So whether you watch the full moon over the Bristol Motor Speedway, like I had an opportunity to do uh, back in the last century, I think, or watching it over a beautiful outcropping there with people enjoying it in a true photographer set up there, we know you're going to be out looking at the moon tonight uh, at any time it's in the sky. Uh, it's there for us to, to look at, whether uh, you're an amateur astronomer or not, uh, artists of all kinds i didn't even show you any paintings or poetry done with the moon but it's always a, a, a an inspiration this photo over the radisson hotel that uh, that's uh, south of cape canaveral that's um a satellite beach area there kind of a lucky shot to get that uh, but you never know what you're going to get in today's digital world. You can just rack it up and keep trying. So thought I'd go out tonight, today with this. we got thunder and lightning going on behind us here. And give you a little bit of moonlight inspiration for wherever you are. I hope it's clear on this full moon uh, week. From Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1878, 145 years ago. A poem that I think you could wrap your head around today with an urban setting. Henry Wadworth Longfellow says in this poem, Moonlight, as a pale phantom with a lamp ascends some ruins haunted stair, so glides the moon along the damp, mysterious chambers of the air. Now hidden in a cloud and now revealed as if this phantom full of pain were by the crumbling walls concealed and at the window seen again. Until at last, serene and proud in all the splendor of her light, she walks the terraces of the cloud, supreme empress of the night. I look but recognize no more objects familiar to my view. The very pathway to my door is an enchanted avenue. All things are changed. One mass of shade, the elm trees drop their curtains down by palace, park, and colonnade as I walk in a, as if I walk in a foreign town. The very ground beneath my feet is clothed with a diviner air. White marble paves the silent street and glimmers in the empty square. Illusion! Underneath there lies the common life of every day. Only the spirit glorifies with its own tints the somber gray. In vain we look, in vain uplift our eyes to heaven, if we were blind, we see but what we have the gift of seeing. What we bring, we find. And Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 145 years ago, mystified by the moon, just like I hope you were in staying curious today. So, Marty, thank you very much, as we've had a, another bit of lunacy on Stay Curious. We've got lined up, as I said, Hazel Banks. Uh, a secretary for the Apollo era, and uh, she did dictation for the astronauts, drove their their uh, family cars back to Houston, has some other stories that she hasn't told before. We look forward to having you on the program tomorrow, Hazel. And then Wednesday, we're going to have astronaut Winston Scott on, and Winston is uh, here at the museum, going to do a talk to a bunch of Japanese students. So, we will try to cue you up early when Winston will be on. He may be on as early as 3.30 or as late as 4.30, but we're not going to let Winston Scott hang around. We'll go live, and then you can watch it whenever you want it. So, uh, And then, of course, we'll have some uh, shuttles of the month of August. Kick that off, and then future Fridays. So hope you stick around and stay curious with Marty and I as we enjoy doing this program for you to celebrate space history like no other. Marty, thank you for another outstanding job. Thank you for taking care of uh, the anomaly earlier there. And uh, we have gremlins in our studio. Lightning behind us here, so we'll get out of here before the lightning shuts me up. So until tomorrow when we have Hazel Banks, NASA Executive Secretary, on our show, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. <laughs>